Morning, everyone. Great to see everybody. Those of you that are here with us, I want to welcome you. If anybody's visiting with us, I want to, want to welcome you. Glad you're here. Hope that everyone will stick around after the service. We've got, always have coffee and refreshments uh, in the Fellowship Hall. You can linger here in the sanctuary if you'd like. And then uh, after refreshments, we've got uh, Sunday school classes for, for all the different ages. Uh, beginning at 1145, the adult class it meets here in the sanctuary. Uh, Brian Groot's been leading this class on worship. Brian is away. Uh, we can keep him in prayer. This is something he had committed to uh, months ago. He'll be, he's preaching this morning at uh, Calvary OPC in Ringo, so we can keep him in prayer. In, in his absence, he has prepared a, there's a video for us on, on English hymnody, so hymns uh, by Ligon Duncan. So that should be a good video we'll be watching this morning in the adult class. I failed to mention last week, I've been announcing this for a month and then I forgot to mention last week. Uh, tonight is our joint Reformation service at Grace OPC in Pennsville. We do these quarterly joint meetings in the evening. It's great fellowship with our brothers and sisters from Grace, Grace Pennsville and Emmanuel Belmar and Providence Church Mantua and Faith Church Pole Tavern. It's a great time to worship. Elaine Tipton is an OPC pastor and he was a longtime uh, seminary professor at Westminster. He's going to be speaking. And if you can make it tonight, it should be a great evening of worship. And I encourage you to, if you can, bring some refreshments to share. There'll be an opportunity to, to, for refreshments uh, afterward. But that is tonight. And, and Grace Church, they do a great, whenever we host a joint service, they always come out. And so if we can return the favor, you'll be blessed. It'll be an encouragement to them as well. Um, it, make sure you pick up the new Table Talk devotional magazine for, for November. If you haven't already, those are, those are available for you in the entryway. And uh, if you haven't already signed up to host uh, the Groots on a Sunday afternoon or some other time, I hope you'll do that. Um, next Lord's Day, next Sunday, we're celebrating the Lord's Supper. And as we always collect a, a monthly deacon's offering, the, the offering next month is in support of the OPC disaster relief, the hurricane response. So if you've been, I'm sure you've been following the things on the news. Uh, maybe you're concerned about uh, Daniel Halley and the, his church family. Um, this is an opportunity to give to support our denomination's disaster response. Uh, it's, a, it's a great ministry because we actually, the denomination sends people down there to help do some hands-on work and help renovate homes. And it's, it's a great ministry. It's also a great witness because they, they, they begin in the homes of church, fam church families that have had disaster that need help. But as they get into the neighborhoods, then they meet neighbors and they get a chance to, to help other neighbors as they're able on their homes and witness to them in the process. So it's a great ministry. So deacons will be collecting that deacon's offering uh, next week if you want to give to help support that, that disaster relief. Um, in your bulletin this morning, you should have a, a, the new shepherding group list. And for those of you that might be newer with us, we simply try to assign an elder to every family that's either a member or a regular attender uh, so that if you have needs or questions at any time, you know who you can speak to. You can always speak to me or any elder, but that just gives you an idea. Uh, but also, um, periodically, we try to gather together in our shepherding groups, and it provides just kind of a, a casual informal opportunity outside of worship, uh, often in people's homes, when you can just kind of get together and get to know each other in a more relaxed way. We often do those on the first Sunday of the month. Um, in fact, next Sunday, Elder Mixner's group is going to be meeting at his home right after Sunday school. Uh, so they'll be providing a homemade soup and chili. And so if you're in Elder Mixner's group, you're encouraged to, 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 to bring a side dish or dessert and, and join the Mixners at their home. If you're in Elder Sipes group or Elder Elwell's group, those groups are going to be meeting combined here in the Fellowship Hall at 6 uh, next Sunday. And you can just bring some sort of snack to share. But, but we're hoping that as we move forward that we'll all be actively participating in the shepherding groups. It, it really is a, it's a great way. It's an important way we get to know each other and build those relationships. It's also an important way your elder gets to know you and you get to know your elder so that when you do have needs and questions and concerns, you don't feel like you're going to a stranger, but you've got somebody who knows you now and knows how to press pray for you and, and care for you. So just take note of the, that shepherding group list in the bulletin. And if, if there's a misspelling if there's a typo, if your name is accidentally left off, if you need to be in a different list than the one you're in, just let me know. I mean, we always, we always have adjustments we need to make, and we never know sometimes certain families or sometimes just administratively something, somebody gets left off by accident. It's not intentional. So let me know, but please check over that, that list. Um, continue to pray for our brother Bob Grant. Thank the Lord. He's with us this morning, uh, every day. With Bob is a battle uh, with, with cancer, so pray, pray for, continue to pray for Bob. We thank God for him. Uh, pray for our sister Carol Duffy. Uh, she's got an appointment coming up on the 30th with a surgeon to see if 
Surgery is going to be necessary for her hip, but keep her in prayer. Uh, pray for Liz Hernandez as she oversees the staff at the Board of Elections. This is, a, as you can imagine, very, very intense, very hectic, uh, pressure-filled time. So Liz especially needs our prayers. Um, we, we mentioned Bria injured her foot, uh, so keep her in prayer. Also, her cousin, uh, Brooke's one-year-old niece, fell out of a high chair and broke her leg. So you don't think of a one-year-old broken her leg, breaking her leg, but she did. So, so keep her in your prayers. Um, Continue to pray for our sister, Tracy Morris. Tracy's with us this morning. Thank God. Continue to pray for her. Continue to pray for Damaris. Damaris is able to be with us. Um, obviously, pray for Daniel Hadley and the hurricane, the victims of the hurricane. We've got a lot of things to pray about. We mentioned last week that we are hoping to have uh, Brian Groot as, our, as an intern beginning next July uh, as part of our OPC denominational internship program. So we've got to apply for that. They've got to approve our application. If they do, they, they, they cover half the cost. But pray for that and, and, and pray that the Lord will um, enable our, our plans to proceed. F finally, a matter of praise. We want to praise the Lord. Uh, Ron and Marion Elwell have a new grandson, uh, Willem was born this Thursday to Ryan and Kayla. So we thank God for that. But a lot of things to think about and pray about uh, as we prepare for worship. Finally, uh, Elder Sipe has an announcement about an upcoming conference, and then I'm going to be leading us in our call to worship. Good morning, everyone. I just wanted to make uh, everyone aware that uh, there is a, um, a seminar coming up. It's put on by... Uh, Harvest uh, USA, and the title of this seminar is, is uh, Parenting in a Sexually Confused World. It's right here in our backyard, uh, up near uh, uh, Glass, Glassboro, and um, I'm going to tack this. There's a description of it. I'll tack it on the bulletin board back there if you're interested. You can talk to me if you want, and I'm gonna, also going to put there's a, uh, a new... Um, little magazine that Harvest puts out uh, each month now. This is the first one. And it has some really interesting articles. So um, if, you're, if you're family or if, uh, of course, our community is affected by this uh, situation of sexuality, and uh, it's, it's, uh, this is a good, good source that will help us be biblically grounded and uh, give us uh, some some good answers to give people and for ourselves too so if you're interest, interested interested uh, let me know thank you thank you john uh, let's rise and let's hear our, our our call to worship actually it's printed there for you uh, in the bulletin it's a responsive call to worship so i'll invite you to read and 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 respond uh, with me from god's word as we're encouraged this morning to call upon the name of the lord and be saved if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For the scripture says everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's, let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the powerful name of Jesus Christ, a name that's above all names, the only name by which we may be saved. We praise you for that name and pray that all of our, all our hope, all our confidence, our trust, our faith, all of our assurance, everything within us would rest completely and fully and entirely on the name of Jesus, in whose name we pray this morning. Amen. Uh, amen. Please remain standing and turn with me in your hymnal to hymn number 64. Uh, we begin our worship this morning with hymn number 64. It's a familiar tune. Hymn number 64, God the Lord, a King remaineth.
Amen. You may be seated, and if you would, turn with me in your Bible to the book of Romans, Romans uh, chapter 3, uh, verses 10 to 18. This is from Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Rome. I'll be uh, reading this portion of God's word to us this morning in preparation for our prayer of confessions. Let's read and hear uh, God's word together. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They, they use their tongues to deceive. The, the venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and misery. The way of peace they've not known. There's no, no fear of God before their eyes. Uh, the reading of God's word. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we, we, cannot, help, we cannot help but pray for our brothers and sisters this morning whom we love. We do pray for Bob Gramp and for Damaris Perez and Tracy Morris and Elder Fenton, for Michael Smith and Carol Duffy, for Liz Hernandez and all her responsibilities at this very demanding time, for Bria and her little cousin, for Daniel Halley and, and other victims of, of the recent storms, it seems they've had so much rain. Lord, we have had little. We've had none. Lord, we're, we're so we're weak. We're, we're weak, Father, and our needs are great. Have mercy on us. And yet, oh Lord, we're not worthy. We're reminded this morning. We're not worthy. We're not, we're not righteous in ourselves. None of us are. None of us are naturally seeking after you. None of us naturally seeks to know you. We've all, we've all turned away, as the psalmist says. We, in ourselves, have become worthless. We, we haven't been that, that, that blessing to the community, that, that salt, that light, that healing, transformative agent, Lord. We haven't been that powerful influence in our families, in our community, uh, that, that you've called us to be. Our, our words and our actions at, at time have, have even been hurtful and, and destructive. We, we, we simply haven't feared you as we ought or, or sought to live before you as we ought and even when we do even when we seek to live for you Lord we, we still fall short very short and Lord we ask for mercy for forgiveness for compassion for grace we pray Lord through the, the blood work the saving work the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ your son in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Apostle Paul reminds us that since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's, uh, let's stand and, and turn with me in your hymnal this time to hymn number 705, a, a wonderful hymn of assurance. We can be honest, we can acknowledge uh, the depths of our sin, and we can still know the Lord and praise him and trust him through Jesus. So turn with me in your hymnal to him, 705, a wonderful hymn of assurance. I know whom I have believed. Hymn 705.
Amen. Amen. You may be seated and the ushers will come forward and collect our tithes and offerings.
Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, we do thank you this morning for the birth of this new grandson in the Elwell family. We also praise you for the possibility of having Brian here next year as an intern. Lord, we pray that you'd provide all of the means necessary that we might better serve you in our lives and individually and together corporately as a congregation. This morning we pray specifically for the lost in our community, for friends, for family members, for co-workers, acquaintances, people in, 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 in this particular neighborhood and in all our neighborhoods, for those we have not yet met, for members of our community who do not yet know you or, or who may have wandered far from you, for those who do not have a church family, uh, for those who aren't regularly in worship, for those who are untaught or, or poorly taught, for for those who maybe worship with us online but not in person, for those who, who lack community, who, who need a support system, who are alone, for those who have not yet surrendered to you, bowed the knee to you, who have not yet made peace with you through the blood of your Son. Lord, Lord, we pray for clear, convincing, convicting, decisive, and fruitful conversions. We ask these things, Lord, even as we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'll ask if you would turn with me now in your Bible uh, to the Gospel of Luke. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verses uh, 26 to 38. We've recently begun a new series on the, the true story of Christmas. Um, last week we, we looked at a at a a message that was that was too good to believe. This morning we want to consider together an, an even more amazing message. Again, our, our text this morning we're in the Gospel of Luke chapter one, uh, picking up with verse twenty six. I remind you in this study where we're, we're studying the the true story of Christmas. Again, Luke chapter one, beginning with verse twenty six. This is the word. Of our God. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and Tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. And behold, you'll conceive in your womb and bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. The reading of God's word. Let's, uh, let's begin with prayer. Father in heaven, as a child looks to his father, or a maid servant looks to her master, so we look to you this morning for Instruction for, for clarity, for certainty, and truth. We ask this, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're talking about the true story of 
Christmas. With all due respect to all the traditions and legends and tales that are associated with Christmas, and there are many, there are many wonderful legends, traditions, stories associated with Christmas, but with all due respect to all those various traditions, the, the purpose of this study is we want to get back to the beginning, back to the basics, back to the facts. We want to put on the cap of the, of the journalist, the hat of the, of the historian, and, and we, want to, we want to know what really happened. We want to set aside for a moment the, the legends the traditions and the tales, and, and we want to discover for ourselves the, the true story of Christmas. Well, we saw last week that the true story of Christmas begins during a very bleak time in the history of Israel, a time when God had not spoken for centuries. For more than 400 years, there hasn't been a prophet, a, a vision, an angel, a prophecy, nothing. God has been silent as, as, as if the heavens have been closed up, as if, as if God has turned away from his people. And during that time, actually, the people have turned away. They've, they've fallen into this very superficial, outward, shallow, and even legalistic and, and strictly ceremonial religion. Not to mention the fact they've fallen under the oppression of the Romans and that cruel tyrant King Herod. But it's during that dark time they were introduced to a, an aged priest, a godly man named Zechariah, who has never been able to have children. His wife was barren. But now in his latter years, we saw that he was chosen as the priest to go into the holy place and, and offer incense on the altar of incense. And, and as he offers the incense on the altar of incense, as the, as the clouds of, 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 of the incense go up, and as the people outside are praying, an angel of the Lord, Gabriel, appears to Zechariah, announcing good news. The word there, evangel, the word we translate gospel. The angel appears and announces good news. And it's, it's such a wonderful message that, that Zechariah is, is going to have a son, that his wife is going to have a son in their old age, and that he's going he's to be a, a fulfillment of the prophecy of Malachi, that, that he's going to prepare the way of the Lord and, and turn many people back to God. It, it's such a great message that for Zechariah, it's, it's just too good to believe. Well, now we pick up this morning with a a humble young woman, not an elderly priest, but a, a young virgin, a, a young girl, as it were, who, who receives an even greater and even more amazing message, uh, which she receives with, with humility and faith. Uh, let me remind you where we left off, if you would, look at our text. Uh, back in verse 24, we saw that um, after these days, that is after the angel Gabriel appeared uh, to, to Zechariah. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. That is, she, she became pregnant, as the angel had said. And for five months, she kept herself hidden. We talked about this last time, that we don't know why Elizabeth kept herself hidden for the first five months of her pregnancy. She doubtless had her reasons. We don't know what they were. But that leads us to our text this morning because in verse 26 it says, In the sixth month, that is in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel of, of Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee. Now, now keep in mind, I didn't mention this last week. This angel Gabriel is the same angel who previously, hundreds of years, more than 400 years prior, had appeared to Daniel a very high-ranking official in the court of the great uh, empire of Babylon. And, and so this angel had appeared to Daniel in, in Babylon, and now, many, many, many centuries later, had appeared to Zechariah the priest in the holy place of the temple. Where is he going next? Perhaps the palace of Herod the Great, or maybe even to Rome, into the emperor's palace? No, we're told that the, the, the angel is sent to a city of Galilee. Well, G Galilee was some three, three days journey, some 70 miles to the north of Jerusalem. And it was just a, it was the hill country. It, it was nowhere. Keeping in mind that Luke, remember, is writing to a man named Theophilus, whom we believe likely was a wealthy, powerful, influential Roman magistrate in or around the city of Rome, who all of this would have been foreign to him. I mean, he's, if he's in or around Rome and, 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 he, and he's hearing about something that happened in, 
in Jerusalem, why that's exotic, that's foreign, that's, that's Semitic, that's Arabic, that's the Middle East. It's all foreign, but at least he would have probably heard of, the, heard of Herod the Great. He's heard of Jerusalem, but he's never, you can be sure, he'd never heard of Galilee. And he certainly never heard of this town called Nazareth. Uh, Nazareth was on one of the southernmost, is on the northern side of the, one of the southernmost uh, Lebanese mountains. Okay, the mountain Lebanese mountain range. Um, it was it was kind of conveniently locating a, a convenient stopping place between two pagan cities of Tyre and Sidon, which meant the city of Nazareth was kind of well, it was mostly unknown. It was never even mentioned in in, in, in the Old Testament, so it's mostly unknown among most people in Israel, but for those who did know about it, it did not have a good reputation because it had an unusually high population of, of Roman soldiers and just pagan people. Later, Nathaniel, who was a, a godly man, he was called an Israelite in whom there's no guile, uh, Nathaniel kind of lived around that area. We're talking about uh, Nazareth is located 22 miles or so uh, to the east of the Mediterranean and, and 15 miles to the west of the Sea of Galilee. Nathaniel lived around the Sea of Galilee, so he at least knew, he knew what Nazareth was. And this godly Nathaniel would later say, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It was just that kind of place. And, and, and yet we read this morning that in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee called Nazareth uh, to a virgin in, in other words to, to a, a young girl a young lady and, and scholars believe she was about 12 or 12 and a half years old they say that based on the fact that it says she was betrothed okay and betrothal was a, a very formal uh, situation in which you had a, a formal public legal uh, ceremony in which you gave solemn vows and you pledged yourself. When you became betrothed, you became husband and wife. They were legally binding. In fact, the only way to break up a betrothal was by a divorce. And so, in a sense, she's married. And yet, after the betrothal, the, the, the husband would have time, months, to, to leave his parents' house and, and prepare a house for himself before she would actually move in and, and, the, and the marriage be uh, celebrated and consummated. It, it, it's... That usually occurred, the betrothal, scholars believe, when a, when a young lady was about 12 or 12 and a half. So we believe that she was a quite, quite young. It says she's betrothed to a, a man named, whose name was Joseph. We don't really know anything about Joseph, uh, it, except um, later we're told he, he was a builder, which could mean carpenter or stonemason, most likely both. I mean, you, you, that, you, that's what you, those are the materials you use to build. Um, and it says of the house of David. Well, we don't know grammatically. Does it mean Joseph was of the house of David? Because he, he was. Or is it, is it going back to Mary was of the house of David? Well, she was as well. They both were. Whichever point is, is Luke is trying to make here, just be clear that even though David had been king, that was so many, many, many hundreds of years ago. Don't think for a moment that Mary and or Joseph are living in some sort of palace. These are, these are humble uh, probably uneducated people. In fact, it's assumed that, that young Mary probably didn't know how to read, had probably received no formal education, and had probably never left her own hometown at this point. And, and, and yet we're told that the angel Gabriel, and remember he, he, he told Zechariah, I am Gabriel and I stand in the presence of the Most High God. And this angel is sent to this young girl. That someone like Theophilus would have considered an absolute nobody. Again, if Theophilus is anything like we suspect, wealthy, powerful, influential, probably a, a Roman magistrate in or around the city of Rome, some little girl who lives in a no-name town, she's a nobody. But as we saw last week, the Christmas story is first and foremost a story of humiliation. Not our humiliation, but a story in which, in which God humbles himself to, to favor uh, the lowest among us. 
Um, Martin Luther says it this way. God might well have gone to Jerusalem and picked out the daughter of Caiaphas. Caiaphas was the high priest at the time. He said, he said God might well have gone to Jerusalem and picked out the daughter of Caiaphas, who was fair, rich, clad in gold embroidered raiment, and attended by a retinue of maids in waiting. But God preferred a lowly maiden from a little mean town. Notice at this point, Luke hasn't even mentioned her name. Because in the eyes of the world, that would not have mattered. Luke is writing for Theophilus, and by extension, those out there in the outer world. And they wouldn't have really cared who this was. But the story of Christmas is the story of God humbling himself and coming down to the, to the, to the nobodies, to the people on the fringe, to the, to the people that aren't necessarily respected and admired, and the people who are mostly ignored. And it says the angel came to her. Some scholars would say well, what it means there in some translations, entering in, the idea some would suggest is that, that the angel comes into Mary's house. Now, when the angel appeared to, 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 uh, to Zechariah, Zechariah is, is at the altar, he's praying, and he looks up and there's the angel. Some have suggested this is different, that, that the, the angel doesn't just appear, but the angel comes in the door like a, like a member of the family or a friend of the family, perhaps not to, to startle her. We don't know that, but what's important is that the angel came to her. The angel came to little Mary. Don't, don't skip over that because the angel did not come to Elizabeth. Elizabeth was a godly elderly woman who suddenly finds herself pregnant. But the angel never came to her and said, Elizabeth, you're going to conceive and have a son. Instead, Gabriel, the angel, went to Elizabeth's husband and, and told Zechariah, your wife's going to conceive. He, the angel never went to Elizabeth. You would think with this little girl Mary, the angel would go to her parents. Where are her parents? Well, we don't know. Presumably they were nearby. The angel didn't go to her parents. The angel didn't even go to Joseph. You know, legally Joseph is her husband. You would think, okay. Uh, later, later once she's showing, an angel, we don't know if it's the same one, an angel would appear to Joseph in a dream. But here, the angel comes directly to her. This, this little girl, against all, all expectation. The angel comes to her. And he says to her, Greetings, O oh favored one, the Lord is with you. Greetings, literally rejoice, but that's a, it was a common greeting. So that's greetings, O oh favored one. He says, little Mary, you are favored by God. The Lord is with you. Not, not the typical greeting. The typical greeting might be, the Lord be with you. Right? That's a blessing, a prayer, a greeting, the Lord be with you. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say the Lord be with you. He said the Lord is with you. Greetings. Mary, the, the Lord is with you. Um, this shouldn't surprise us. Um, Isaiah 57, thus says the one who's high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who's of a contrite and lowly spirit. God lives in the high and holy place, but he also dwells with the humble and lowly of heart. Psalm 138. Though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly. And so the message here is little Mary, the high and exalted God, is down here with you. I, I, I don't want to get away from our text. But this particular greeting becomes of such importance historically. Again, we're trying to, we're trying to get back to the, 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 what really happened, the true story. Sometimes so many traditions and legends and accretions have added over the centuries that you have to clear them away. And many of them, many of the traditions began with this greetings, oddly enough. Because Luke is writing in the Greek. He's writing for Theophilus and, and the average people beyond Israel are Greek-speaking people. So he's writing the Greek, but some 300 years later, Jerome would translate it into the Latin. Because the Latin was the language of the scholar. The legal documents, the important, the formal documents are written in Latin. And so later, Luke, uh, Jerome is going to translate it into Latin. And, and what we read here as greetings, O favored one, becomes translated hail. That's fine. Hail. Hail Mary, full of grace. Well, grace is okay. Favor, grace, that's the same thing. But when Jerome translates it, it becomes full of grace. Well, he doesn't say that. He just says favored. 
But, but that's okay. That's okay as long as we understand that what the angel is saying is God's grace is with you. God favors you. Um, but this idea, this translation, Hail Mary, full of grace, uh, begins to take on a life of its own. And, and there, it, it, within some traditions, it becomes thought that not just that, not just that Mary is the, the object of God's grace and the recipient of God's grace, but that Mary is so full of grace that she is a dispenser of grace. Some 1,200 years later, um, Gregory the Great would, would, would record a prayer, which has become known as the, as the Ave Maria, the Hail Mary. You know, you hear people say, i got to say five Hail Marys. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a prayer based on, in part, on this greetings. Um, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Well, this is, a, this is the angel greeting Mary, but it somehow over the centuries evolved to be used as a prayer, a means by which we talk to Mary. Uh, Roman Catholic theologians would say, well, we don't pray to Mary the same way we pray to God, but you understand how there's, this, there's an evolution here. And then some 300 years after that, that prayer is... is is added on to, um, to say, um, where is it? Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. And so what begins in, in the text, which is simply a greeting as the angel greets Mary, evolves into, into a whole other idea in which, in which Mary, in, in the minds of some, becomes the co-redeemer, the 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 redemptrix, as she's called, a source of grace, one who intercedes for us and prays for us. Well, our purpose this morning is not to dishonor Mary, but our purpose is to, is to get back to the, the text and, and what was really happened and what really said. And, and what he says here is, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled. Now, we shouldn't be surprised that, that Mary was troubled because, after all, Zechariah was troubled when he saw the angel. Right? And, and Zechariah was an aged man, an elderly priest, well-educated. And we're told that when Zechariah saw, saw the angel, he was troubled and filled with fear. So we can understand if little Mary is troubled. And yet, I think it's worth noting, we're not told that Mary was filled with fear. Zechariah is an old, aged, experienced, learned priest. And when he saw the angel in the holy place, he was frightened. We're not told. We're told that, that Mary was troubled, but not frightened. And interestingly enough, it doesn't appear that she's frightened by the presence of the angel. If you go back and read what we looked at last week, it appears Zechariah was simply frightened by the appearance of the angel. Before the angel even spoke, he's troubled and frightened. There's no evidence here that she's frightened or even troubled by the presence of the angel rather we're told she's troubled by what the angel says okay he came to her and said greetings O troubled one uh, the lord is with you but she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be in other words she doesn't seem to be upset that an angel is coming to her house but she seems to be troubled that this angel has just called her favored as if to say who me and the angel says to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And again, the, the, the message here is, is not that Mary is somehow a dispenser of grace and favor, but that she's the recipient of God's grace and favor. That God, in his mercy and compassion, humbles himself to, to favor even the, the least among us. Right? God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. And, and notice also here in verse 30, the angel calls her by name. Do not be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. Again, Luke was, Luke was kind of almost reticent to, to even mention Mary's name because he knows that for the reader wouldn't care about Theophilus, doesn't care the name of this little girl. But this angel knows her name. Gabriel, who stands in the presence of the Most High, he knows his name because he's sent by God and God knows her name. The world, world might consider you a nobody. The world might consider you irrelevant. The world might not think of you at all. 
God knows you. He knows your wrinkles, your scars, your stories, your feelings, your quirks. He knows every hair in your head. He knows you by name. In Psalm 139, David said, Lord, you've searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, Lord, you know it all together. God knows you so well. He knows all your habits and and patterns and struggles and questions and and thoughts. And he knows what you're going to say before you even say it. David says, Lord, you formed my inward parts. You needed me together in my mother's womb. God knows you inside and out because he put you together in your mother's womb. The world might consider you a nobody, a nothing. But God knows you by name and sent a son to save you. The angel says, behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. And this is what theologians call the annunciation. It's the announcement that the virgin will give birth. The virgin will conceive. Behold, you'll conceive in your womb and bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. Well, I didn't mention, I don't think, Mary was a very common name. In fact, Bible students get confused even to this day because there's so many Marys. It was a common name back then. Well, so was the name Jesus. It, it, it was a form of the Hebrew name Joshua, which means uh, the Lord is salvation. Or we would say the Lord saves. Uh, the angel doesn't explain it here. At least Luke doesn't mention that. But he does say, you, you, you're going to name him Jesus. Right? And, and, and he will be great. Now, when Zechariah received a message from, uh, from the angel regarding his son John, he's told that, that John will be great before the Lord. Here, Mary is simply told, your son is going to be great. It's unqualified. But then he goes on to say, uh, and, and, and will be called the son of the Most High. And, and some take that to mean Jesus will be called the son of God as opposed to the son of Joseph. And that's certainly true in certain senses. I mean, biologically, legally he's the son of Joseph, but biologically he wasn't the son of Joseph. So, but I don't, God's plan of redemption unfolds gradually. And so we have to resist the temptation to to, to jump too far ahead. We want to take the, as it comes and, and, the term son of God or son of the most high, or, these were common titles for kings and, and rulers in the ancient world. Uh, son of the most high would have been understood as a, as a title for the Messiah, the king who is to come. So most likely that's how Mary would have understood it, that, that, that her, her child's going to be the Messiah. He's going to be the king. In fact, that's what the angel says. Uh, he will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. In other words, Christ was born to sit on the throne and to rule over God's people and his kingdom forever. Uh, It says, he will be called the son of the most high God and the Lord will give to him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. There's something called the Davidic promise or or the Davidic covenant in which God promised to King David that David would always have a descendant, a literal, a physical descendant to sit on the throne forever and ever. We call that the Davidic covenant, the Davidic promise. And here the angel says that in fulfillment of God's promise, your son is going to be the one. Remember Remember, Mary and Joseph are of the house of David. And and so your son will be given the the throne of the house of David and will rule uh, forever and ever. And yet, and yet Herod is king of the Jews. How is that going to work? Right? They're, they're suffering under Roman rule, and, and currently Herod is the king, and yet and yet Mary is told that her son is going to be king, and she takes the angel at his word. She takes it at face value. Um, John the Baptist would be the forerunner. He would be the messenger to go. And then Jesus would be the king. John would prepare the way. So what we saw last week is that Zechariah, this godly, aged, educated priest, is given this amazing message. And for him, it was, it was too much to swallow. You remember Zechariah said, how can I know this? You know, my, my wife and I, we're old, we're advanced in years. Zechariah basically says, give me a sign, you know, help me. Give me something to help me believe this. 
Zechariah received a message that for him was too good to believe. This little girl, this humble young woman, this preteen, receives an even more amazing message. And she believes it. She accepts it. She receives it with humility and faith. Verse 34, Mary says to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? Literally, how will this be since I've not known a man? I haven't known a man in that way. How is this going to work? Um, she's young, naive, inexperienced, likely, you know, she's not exactly worldly wise. She likely hasn't traveled at all. She's uneducated, but she knows where babies come from. And so she's asking, uh, how is this going to work? There's no indication of unbelief or doubt. She's not asking for proof. She's not asking for a sign. She's just saying, how is this going to work? As if to say, okay, what do I need to do? Do I need to move up the wedding date? Should I go ahead and move in? You know, go ahead and have the celebration and, and for, finalize everything with you? You know, that, she seems to be okay. She seems to be a, a, an amazing example of what Jesus would later call childlike faith. Does she understand it all? Does she have all the answers? No. She just wants to know, okay, what do I need to do? Okay. Again, we want to honor Mary this morning. I have no desire to dishonor her, but there, there have been so many traditions. Uh, this is such an important, she's such an important person, and this is such an important moment that there have been so many traditions that we, we just have to clear away. I mentioned last week that as as Greek philosophy is worldly thinking. Later we get into the church. Christians would begin to have a distorted understanding of marriage and family and the body and sexuality. And, and so even though during this time it was expected that priests, of course priests would marry and have children. That's where you get the next generation of priests. Yet, uh, yet over time it would later be thought that priests should marry. That somehow it's better to be celibate. Well, as, as, as that kind of pagan thinking got into the church... Mary's question becomes reinterpreted. She says, literally, how will this be since I've never been with a man? And over time, that came to be interpreted, how will this be since I've never been with a man and never will be? So that this became understood as a, as a vow of celibacy. If, if, if marriage and sexuality in the body is kind of unspiritual, if marriage was considered an unfortunate necessity... If somehow it's more spiritual to be celibate, it became necessary to believe that, that, that Mary is celibate. And, and so, uh, in, in the year 553, she was declared by the church the ever virgin. Which was later clarified to be the perpetual virgin. Uh, well, we're not trying to dishonor her anyway. But the best way, I think, to honor her is to... To remove the accretions, to get as close as we can to the, to the text, to the facts. And to appreciate her for the godly young lady that she is. The angel says to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. You know, she's asked, how am I going to get pregnant? I've never been. And, 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 and the angel explains that she will become with child absent the normal, natural, physical role of the male. That is, the Christ child was to be conceived in the womb of a virgin by, by a supernatural act of God's spirit. This is very careful, very delicate, very chaste wording. There's no hint of, of, of anything sexual here. This is not a crude Greek tale. Okay, there are crude Greek tales in which one of the gods, like Zeus, comes down and seduces a maiden. And, and the resulting child is, is, is a demigod, half god, half man, Hercules or something. There are pseudo-scholars who want to lump this in with all these ancient Greek tales. Those Greek tales, first of all, are dated hundreds of years prior. And by this time have already passed out of popularity. Uh, the, the Greeks of this time, by and large, no longer even believed those old things. Besides, Luke's a doctor. He knows where babies come from. And so what we have this morning is not some crude Greek fantasy, but, but rather a, 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 a statement of, of fact that the Christ child was to be conceived in the womb of a virgin 
by a supernatural act of God's Spirit. And notice carefully the wording. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Okay, now Luke will later use that same language at the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember when, when some of the disciples went with Jesus up on the mountain and Jesus is transfigured, he's transformed, and they, they see him in, in his more fuller uh, glory. Uh, Luke will later say, they saw his glory and then a cloud came and overshadowed them. The, the, the Shekinah glory, the glory cloud came down over them. Last week we talked about the fact that the, what they call the Shekinah glory, the, the visible manifestation of the glory of God, appeared when God led his people out of Egypt, a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. Later when Solomon dedicated the temple, this visible cloud of glory filled the temple. Uh, later when the people had fallen into idolatry and, and the temple was going to be destroyed, first Ezekiel has a vision in which the glory cloud departs, the glory of God leaves the temple. And after these hundreds of years, the temple's been rebuilt. It even took hundreds of hundreds of years to finally finalize that. The glory of God had never never come back. And yet there was that promise in Malachi. The last thing God had said, I'm going to send my messenger to prepare the way, and then I will return to my temple. And we saw last week that the appearance of Gabriel in the temple there at the entrance to the most holy place, the holy, you know, it was a foreshadowing that God was fulfilling his promise, that, that the glory of God was coming back to his temple. And what do we see this morning? The glory cloud, the Shekinah glory, the manifestation of God is coming not first to the building, but coming to the womb of this little girl for the conception of of our Lord Jesus Christ. We, we saw this last week that, that the temple itself, the whole temple, is merely a, a physical testimony, a monument to Jesus Christ. The, 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 the temple is the place where God could, would meet with man, where man could meet with God, and, and that Christ is the prophet, he's the priest, he's the sacrifice, he's, he's the temple. Here we see the, the Shekinah glory, the Holy Spirit overshadows the womb of this little girl. As as the Christ is conceived, the God-man, God incarnate. Therefore, the angel says, the child to be born will be called holy. The child will be called holy. Now, according to the law, every firstborn son, the the, the male child that, that opens the womb is going to be called holy. But... But somehow, and and we've kind of been trying to trace where some of these traditions come from, somehow it came to be understood that that Mary, likewise, is holy. Um, In in, in the the year 1854, Pope Pius IX decreed a doctrine called Immaculate Conception, which is the view that Mary was, quote, kept from the stain of original sin. In other words, not just that Jesus was conceived without sin, but that that Mary was conceived without sin. And so you see how what began with a a questionable translation led to an understanding that that Mary is full of grace and dispenses grace. and She's the co-redeemer to whom we we look for grace. She becomes the, the Holy Mother. That's just not what we're told. We're told the the child will be called holy. The Son of God. He, he is the eternal son of God. We are not want to deny that. We don't deny the, what we call the hypostatic union, that mysterious union of the divine nature and the human nature. We don't, we don't want to, devi- to deny any of that. We, we see the, the, the trinity at work here. That the Holy Spirit overshadows. The most high is the father. The son is the eternal son. But again, what seems to be at play here, or at least what's most prominent, is this idea that from the beginning... Christ is set apart as, as the Messiah, as, as the ruler. Um, in a couple of chapters, Luke will use this same term, son of God, to apply to Adam. Right? Luke will refer to Adam, the son of God. Well, Adam wasn't divine, but he was the, he was the ruler. He, had, he was given dominion to rule over the kingdom on behalf of God. And so what we have here is from the beginning, Christ is set apart as a new Adam. A new man, a new king, a new beginning of God's kingdom. And, and, and the good news, this good news of Jesus Christ as Savior and King, 
is presented to us this morning simply as a fact of history. uh, To be accepted with humility and faith. There's nothing here that smacks at all of of legend or or, or mere story. We've seen that Luke is the is the investigative journalist. He's the historian. He has a passion for accuracy. He said that he, he's passing these things down just as they were delivered to him by the eyewitnesses and the apostles, that we might know the certainty of what we've been taught. This, this news of Christ as Savior and King is presented as a fact of history to be accepted with humility and faith. And in fact, that's what Mary does. She says, Behold, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. It's as if she says, okay, thy will be done. May it be so. Amen. It is completely reasonable to expect that God will act in a way consistent with his nature and with his promises. We mentioned this last week that some people think that, that, that religion is just unrealistic. It's unrational. It, it's, it's pre-scientific. That religion is the way people explain things before we had science. Uh, a lot of people think religion is just it's uneducated nonsense. But it's perfectly rational and reasonable to expect that God is going to act in a way consistent with who he is. There's lots of things God can't do. God can't lie. God can't change. He can't sin. He can't do evil. He can't deny himself. God will always act according to his nature. First Catechism says, can God do all things? Yes, he can do all his holy will. And so it's perfectly reasonable and rational to take God at his word and to expect him to do exactly according to his nature and exactly as he's promised. And does Mary understand everything? Does she understand the hypostatic union? Does Mary have any idea, has she, has she paused to think about what this is going to mean, that one day she'll see her, her son crucified before her eyes? Has she thought about that? Has she thought about what are her parents going to think when a few months from now it becomes obvious that she's with child? Has she thought about what is Joseph going to think? What's the community going to say? Is she gonna, is she's going to be obviously the object of, of derision and talk if people find. Has she thought about those things? I don't know. But God doesn't require us to think about all these things. To figure it all out. To figure it out how it's going to work. He, he simply requires us to, to take him at his word. Humble acquiescence. To, to receive his word with humility and faith. There was, Joseph Hall was an English bishop uh, year, years ago. And, and he once said, There's not a more noble proof of faith than without all questioning to go blindfolded wherever God leads us. That's the picture here. She doesn't know what this is going to mean. But she just takes God at his word. And, and the angel departs from her. Okay. We've seen here this morning that, that Mary was favored by God. Uniquely favored. No one can or ever will have the exact role uh, that Mary had. She's uniquely favored. But you too can know God's favor. We can know God's grace. When we, like Mary, take God at his word. Uh, later... When Christ was mature and um, had begun his public ministry, a woman in the crowd would raise her voice and say to Jesus, Blessed is the womb that bore you. That's true. But in that case, Jesus responds, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Mary, in some ways, uniquely favored. We can honor her. But we can also learn from her example. You too can know God's favor and blessing when you, like Mary, (laughs) hear the word of God and keep it. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, may, may we, like Mary, have that humble, submissive faith to take you at your word without stuttering and stammering without making excuses without demanding a sign Lord help us just to take you at your word we ask this Lord we pray in Jesus name Amen All right, if you would uh, turn with me in your hymnal our closing hymn is hymn number uh, 196 Hymn 196, let's stand and sing, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, Hymn 196.
Amen. Hold on to your hymnal. We'll, following the benediction, we'll sing as our benedictory hymn, uh, hymn number 11, uh, verses 1 and 2. That's also printed for you uh, in our order of service. Now may the Lord of peace give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. Amen. Amen.